Hi, I'm Carlo with Race to Walk. Thanks for joining me. And I am here today with Dr. Ben Blackwell and Dr. Randy Hatchett. And we're going to be discussing their book, Engaging Theology. So a little bit about Dr. Hatchett and Dr. Blackwell. They actually are both professors at Baptist University. And that is where I graduated with a master's in apologetics. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, my like interaction with them at Houston Baptist University. So Dr. Hatchett is uh, he teaches a lot of classes, different classes in the School of Christian Thought. And I had him for my class on systematic theology because in the apologetics program we actually normally do a different um, a different class called mere theology, but this just fit better with my schedule. So this is one of the one of the few classes that I took on campus. And I took it with Dr. Hatchett. So a couple things about Dr. Hatchett. So he, this was a night class and he would, we would start like at six o'clock at night. And he, normally when you have like long classes, like for three hours, there's a break. He doesn't take breaks. He will like teach and he'll teach like all the way through, no breaks. So if you ever have a class with him, you need to go in prepared knowing that you just need to be ready to just listen and absorb for as long as he's going to talk because he doesn't take breaks. The other thing was that um, I had actually read quite a bit about some of the, had read some of the, the theology books that were assigned for the apologetics program. And I, there were some of them that I just did not even understand why they were a heresy. And we're gonna be talking about some of those a little bit later in the stream, but like Apollinarianism, I read about that and I was thinking, maybe I'm a heretic because I don't understand why this is a heresy. and. <laughs> He just ex drew this little diagram and explained it to me in like a minute. It, what I had tried to understand myself for, you know, read quite a bit and the filial K controversy. Literally, when I first read about that, I was thinking, I cannot believe we split up a church over this. I don't understand even what the distinction between what the argument was about. So anyway, he is, mm -hmm. he's a great professor. He's a great teacher. He's just is really good at explaining some of these things that are a little bit more difficult to understand. And then Dr. Blackwell, um, I never had a class with him because he doesn't, or do you teach in the apologetics program now? Or you didn't then? Uh, was... No, I've, I've been to the, some of the apologetics day events, but not uh -huh. uh, teach uh, formally in the apologetics program. Okay. But I do oversee the seminary. So I uh, more and more am doing things with the apologetics since that's part under the umbrella of Houston Theological Seminary. Okay. 
Yeah, so the first time I met Dr. Blackwell, it was actually during the orientation. And that was the first time I had even been down to the university. And they had, uh, this is a longer story. I have a, I think I tell the story about it in another um, video that I have on uh, uh, apologetics for the 21st century by Lewis Marcos. But anyway, mm -hmm. I had gotten my acceptance letter on Monday and they had an open house on that Saturday. So I drive down there. I'm a little bit late because I took a turn on Bel Air rather than Vondren and I had to kind of make my way over. So I go walking in and they have all these tables and with the apologetics program, most people are online. So there weren't really people that uh, were in my program. And so I'm sitting at a table with Dr. Blackwell and most of them are math students, theological studies. So Dr. Blackwell's there trying to like get the conversation going and he's sitting there, he'll like ask somebody a question and then they give like a one sentence response and then the conversation would just start stop and then he'd ask another question and then it would just same thing just stop like literally so i just started like talking because i'm thinking nobody's talking at this table and i'm thinking if you have to like rely on an introvert to keep the conversation going there's just something going on here i don't know what the deal is so that was my uh he's very good at uh, engaging people <laughs> Get it engaging people even when they're trying to get back. So anyway, um, we're gonna just I want to tell you a little bit about some of their books. So this is their book, uh, Engaging Theology, and this can be used as a textbook. I guess that's what it's considered. But I we were talking a little bit before the stream, and I think this is something this would be good to have in your library. Just you know, if you're a Christian, you kind of need to know what it is that you're saying that you you believe. So this is one of their latest books. Um, I'm going to go over Dr. Blackwell's books because he has, uh, oh shoot. Okay. I'm sorry. I, we're streaming multiple places and, uh, I lost my, my Amazon live stream, but, um, anyway, but he also has several other books. Um, he has reading Romans in context, reading Mark in context, reading revelation. Um, and also he has a uh, book on Christosis and also Paul and the apocalyptic imagination. So he's written quite a few other books to help people get a better understanding of not only, you know, what it is that we believe, but also the context that the Bible was written in. Mm. And then Dr. Blackwell has also written quite a bit and he has a very long list. You can go to, I will link to his profile at HBU so you can see his full list of um, books that he's written. He has written a lot of chapters in some of the different, uh, these different books. But for people who have been on um, watching some of my videos, um, the, his, he was the editor of the fourth edition of Church History in Plain Language. This one actually gets mentioned quite a bit, like when you, um, if you look on YouTube on videos, or not videos, but books to give to Christians or things that you should have, this book comes up a lot. I actually have um, a, a video where somebody made this comment as a recommendation of one of their top books to give to new Christians. But he actually, uh, this is, if, if you've never learned about church history, this is a screaming overview of the past 2000 years. And I think that it helps put in context a lot of things. Um, it's a place to begin and then pick any any area within it and then read more if you'd like to learn more about it. So that is a little bit about who they are and what they've written, but I'm also going to give them a chance to um, tell, oh, actually I forgot. Yeah, I did not know that you had a, a um, Oh shoot, I didn't put it in here. I'm sorry. Okay, you also wrote a chapter in um, the, what was it? Is it like a visual, um, it's not biblical her hermeneutics, what was it? Oh, it was a Holman Illustrated Bible. I actually bought that. I didn't know you have a, had a chapter in it until I looked on your bio, but I bought that one too, okay. but anyway. Yeah, so there's several I'm, articles there. They're, they're just small articles, but I had one on prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. That's maybe been the one I've heard most about for, uh, through the years, but one on word. And so anyway, there's a few just dictionary references there. Okay. So um, 
I'm going to give you guys a chance to talk a little bit about yourself. Um, do you, Dr. Blackwell, do you want to start? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you uh, for having us on here. It's uh, always um, great to know that the different ways that we're all partnering in the gospel together and uh, sharing uh, this common faith and, and just this passion to help people understand uh, their faith better. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, I've been here at a, a Houston Baptist University, I guess about 11 uh, years now. Um, I helped uh, found Houston the Theological Seminary, which is our graduate programs here. So primarily in, in theology, uh, but also in apologetics and also biblical languages. And so that uh, takes up a good bit of my time, uh, uh, not as in the classroom as much as I want to be. Uh, but my interests are kind of split between the New Testament. Um, so mostly Paul, but a big Jesus fan as well, and uh, the Gospels. And I do a good bit on the kingdom of God when I preach and teach out of the Gospels. And then also uh, church history is very um, essential to me. I, I have a, you know, I'm a, a one-handed charismatic, as they say. I, I don't raise both hands at the same time, just one, you know. But uh, sometimes uh, in, in that world, uh, what that God's fresh movement of the spirit here and now is very important. But uh, one of the things that God set in my heart is just to appreciate God's work throughout history through the spirit and that we can draw on that, that heritage of faith. And so how Christians have lived and interpreted the Bible over the past 2000 years are quite, uh, I think, essential for us as uh, Christians living today to continue that story. And so I think that uh, captures me. I'm uh, married. I've got a, two boys, uh, one about to graduate college and one graduate high school. So uh, at uh, that stage of life. So pleasure to be here. Awesome. Okay, Dr. Hatchett, how about you? Well, again, just uh, starting off, thanks, uh, Carla. Just uh, so wonderful to uh, see uh, you doing, you know, really creative and wonderful things to, to communicate. And, and thanks for letting us share in the opportunity. So I came uh, to HBU a few years ago. I can hardly s uh, ponder it. Now, you may need to be seated, but it was in the fall of 1990. Wow. Uh, he's, he's run out of fingers and toes even to, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's it's, why it struggles. <laughs> it's sort of eclipsing uh, my imagination. But um, I came here uh, as a philosopher of religion by training, but I had already kind of, uh, uh, kind of shifted to theology and uh, my long-standing interest all along has been biblical hermeneutics or interpretation of the Bible. And so as we build a philosophy department, which I uh, was really proud to contribute to, uh, I found my native place sort of in theology doing uh, sort of a, a, a combination of uh, church history and then hermeneutics, and then also sharing the theology load uh, with a variety of people through the years, most recently been, uh, if you just turn me loose without any instructions, in time, I'll be doing history. In other words, I want to know where this came from, what was going on. That's just my natural sort of uh, curiosity. And so um, in, anyway, that's a little bit about what I've been doing and teaching uh, for the last uh, number of years. I've also been active in church life. I do. Uh, my, my family and I were active in Calwood Baptist Church for years and years. Uh, Debbie and I just recently moved our membership to where my daughter serves on staff in Sugarland Baptist. And um, we have uh, four kiddos and they're uh, mostly grown and and uh, uh, doing, doing great uh, people that we just admire and appreciate. And they even seem to kind of don't mind hanging out with us, which is really a, really a neat thing. Uh, through the years, though, I'd break away from Callawood and do um, what we call interim pastorships. You know, in Baptist, every kind of Baptist church selects their own pastor. And so... I was there filling short time, uh, part time uh, replacement preacher until they were able to recruit their new pastor. And uh, so I've done that about 20 times. And so I've been pretty active in church life that way, uh, which is really sort of important about about who I am. So uh, anyway, that's uh, I do nothing really else interesting. I don't build a ship in a bottle or 
you know, <laughs> or play remarkable, uh, you know, game of golf or anything. I, uh, I stay pretty busy at that, but it's, it's a good busy. And, um, and then, um, among other things that are just are wonderful, uh, I lost, I lost a colleague who I didn't lose him. It sounded like he was passing, but he retired at the age of 80, a remarkable mentor and friend. Uh, but uh, the person who we uh, recruited to come take his place was Ben Blackwell, who's oh, wow. proven to be a really, really great friend. And uh, this uh, book is really, I think, uh, uh, I, I like to think of it as a, a project of friendship and a product of friendship and uh, this longstanding interest to kind of show people that theology really, really matters. Yeah. We are going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, before we get to, we're going to start with a little bit more about the book. But um, before we get to that, I just, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are streaming to several different locations. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat or the comments, depending on where you're at. There is a lag. So when you type it, it's going to take us a little bit of time to see it. So, um, some of these books that we've talked about, uh, if you look in the link in the description, I do have, uh, there's it links to a list on Amazon that has all the books that they've written. And if we mention any others that come up, I'll put that in there as well. If you're watching on Amazon Live, it's super convenient for you because it's right below in the carousel. And I'll try to highlight those as we come across them. But um, anyway, so Again, just if you have a question, type it in the chat and just know that there, there is a lag and we will be probably taking um, answering some of those questions either at the at the end of the stream. So I will I will tag them and um, so we can go back to and and talk about them. So anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about the the book Engaging Theology and why theology is important. And I wanted to start with a quote that is from the book that I thought was um, just an awesome quote. And this is, they write, orthodoxy is built on a relationship with God in which we rightly approach him in worship. Right beliefs do not merely give us cognitive information. They orient us to God in a manner of worship because like, because worship, like all relationships, is based on a personal encounter. For this reason, proper belief about Jesus leads to, even entails, a life of obedience to God through Jesus by the Spirit. In short, orthodoxy cannot be separated from orthopraxy or right action. If someone struggles with obedience to Christ, this demonstrates not only a weak will, but a deficient theology about who God is and how he acts. So, that I think is, um, is, it's kind of like the, the spirit behind the book, isn't it? It's like, we can't, if we don't really, uh, know and understand God, we can't, um, how can we really be really in relationship with, with him? So do you guys want to, uh, one of you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, Dr. Hatchett, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I'll say just a word. I, you know, that's been a longstanding kind of, a you know, uh, important theme in Ben's work, I know as well. Uh, it, it surprises sometimes uh, people when they read somebody from the ancient church, like Augustine, for example, and he bitterly kind of warns uh, and criticizes the notion of um, curiosity. And when we hear that, we think, well, gosh, curiosity is a healthy, good thing. Isn't that what makes a good reader? And it doesn't make you perhaps search for God and so on. Uh, but what he meant and what others in the ancient church meant is this these are not just abstract ideas which we kind of you know, you know play like a word game or a puzzle and put together uh, they're not really the kind of thing you can sort of know in in the proper sense if you keep them at arm's length uh, to really know this kind of knowledge you not only have to struggle with some ideas <laughs> and try to learn with clarity um, and kind of, uh, which, which is part of what apologetics does, part of what theology does. But eventually to go the next step, you really need to sort of be open to explore and pursue this 
God. Uh, in other words, you, you can't just know him as an onlooker from a, a long third party kind of distant uh, balcony. Uh, you, you Doctrine's important because when we get things right, we really learn who this God is and we learn how to trust him more. That's a great point. And I think, um, I think that we, I don't know if it's just us and we have a very individualistic society and we think uh, we, especially Protestants, we don't like tradition. We don't like people telling us what to do. We just want to think what we want to think and do it our own way. And um, that's really when it comes down to it, that's in opposition to what we said that we were believing in when we became a Christian because we supposedly said, you know, God, I know that I am flawed and I'm a sinner and I, I can't do it my way. I need to do it your way. And so how can we, how can we really, really be a Christian if we're not willing to do that? If we're not willing to um, submit, you know, what is that? I always forget the reference. Is it James 4, 7, or it's submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And it's like the whole submission thing. And that includes not only what we do, but it includes our mind. Like, we have to acknowledge that there's, that we, we don't have full understanding, that it's it's not our little world and entity. It's like we are, you know, we have a creator that we need to get to know. Um, Dr. Blackwell, do you want to... Yeah, I think that's uh, so right. I mean, there's sometimes in the the church, we have these different tensions that uh, more often, uh, you know, the movement today is to talk about being spiritual, but not religious. And so what that often means is that we have a heart for God and then we want to engage God, but that's kind of separated from some of the traditional practices. Maybe we can use the hands a metaphor for that, like the you have to do these certain things actually to be Christian. And if you do other things here that uh, models other uh, belief systems and uh, religious traditions, but then uh, there's also the head, right? And so our goal with this engaging theology is that um, a theology in its best sense is holistic and in, in that it brings together the head, the heart and the hands. And Oftentimes at church, we're driven to engage God in our heart, but we sometimes lack the the head knowledge, the the good, just basic theology. Like you talked about these heresies, um, you know, some great, important thinking that the church has done over the past 2000 years to to see how theology works together. Um, one of the things that's different about this book is that if you mo read most uh, theology textbooks or they're they're almost all focused on the head in the sense of like, here are right beliefs and, and these are essential doctrines, right? This is what we mean by orthodoxy, but they almost have no uh, space devoted to what does it look like to actually live this out? Mm -hmm. what, what spiritual practices should you do if you believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? What, what things would you do with your hands, with your life and ministry and just work? if you believe these things. And so our goal here is to bring kind of right that balance so that it's not just a bunch of head knowledge, but it's the heart and the hands that are brought together in that. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that's been my, uh, my question a lot recently is if you, you know, so much of this is what we see in the United States today, I think has to do with, a failure of the church to teach its members. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a church or if it's individual Christians or if it's a combination of both, but um, it's like, if you really believe what you say, believe, then maybe you should be acting like it. Like if you believe, I, I think that's so many times, like when I see things out there that, you know, people are corrupt or they're just, um, you know, they're acting because they want the, the page view or the click or the, the next follower, they're being, you know, as extravagant and as outrageous as they can be because that's what they're going for. But, you know, okay, that's the way of the world. But if you say you're a Christian, you say that you believe that in a God who will judge the living and the dead and you are, you know, we all are, are going to be standing before Jesus someday mm -hmm. and have to answer for our actions. So if you believe that, then what are you doing? I mean, literally, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I have a hard time. I mean, 
I have a hard time believing like some of these people are Christians when I see, or I don't even know, or maybe they're poorly discipled Christians. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah. And I think oh, one, one thing that's for me is that, uh, that's a, I think it holds our book together in this, but, and, and what we're doing is, you know, I grew up uh, and, and still very much within the evangelical tradition and on every Sunday morning, we, we preach specific passages of the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so we're really good at knowing what this one passage means, but not so good about how all that fits together in this larger scope of the story. And so this is often what theology is, is putting all those bits and pieces together into this coherent whole. And so there's this larger whole that we'll talk about, uh, particularly with the Nicene Creed, but is just basically the movement from God created the world and has been engaging it and he'll bring it to fruition in the end. And so that's part, that's what holds theology together, but it's also this, what holds the biblical narrative together. And so in that sense of trying to bring the Bible to this next uh, set of coherence, and so that people can see how the different parts work out. Because if you if you only hear the different pieces, you sometimes were like, well, what do I do on Monday morning when I'm at, at my job? I don't see how that relates to this passage there and this. And so, but when you have that larger whole, then it, it becomes easier to understand how it fits together and, and how you live that out. Yeah, when I, um, I don't know that I ever even read any theology at all before before I joined the apologetics program. Um, I went to a private Christian school for six years. And so I knew a lot more of church history than I think most people do. Um, I did not realize until I was sitting in a class on Molinism with William Lee Craig, when he was outlining like what the different beliefs are between like Calvinism, Molinism and Arminianism. I didn't believe uh, or, or I didn't realize until then that I had been in pretty fundamentalist churches um, up until recently um, that some of the things that I had been taught were taught from a particular perspective. And I didn't realize that there were other ways of viewing things. Mm-hmm. And um, it was even now I have to look at like every time I approach something, I have to ask myself, OK, how am I? how am I understanding this? Is it because of this influence of this teaching that I had before? Do I have a right understanding? And it's almost a constant thing. Like if, if these things are true, then how should I be looking at this? Like how, how should I be seeing this right now? If, if these other things are true, but if you've only been, if you don't understand like the, the foundation, that, that was one thing that even the, the very first book I read on theology, you don't normally have this, it doesn't, these doctors don't normally come up in conversations specifically, but your understanding comes up all the time. Like if, you know, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, but you know, the, a lot of the QAnon conspiracies, I mean, if you have people in your church that are engrossed in that, you have a problem because they have some very heretical beliefs about who God is and eschatology and who Jesus is and the plan of salvation. There's a literal, it's literally become a cult. There's a whole like structure within it that's come up. And, you know, if pastors don't realize that, and if they can't explain, you know, these are the basic things of what we believe. This is who we believe God is. This is who Jesus is. This is, this is how you're saved. And, you know, like, if you can't explain that to your people, you have some problems and there is a literal threat to them in the world, you know, on the internet daily with all the stuff that's being propagated. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, if the church is aware of that or I don't know, Dr. Hatchett, what about you? You, you interact with a lot of churches. So, I mean, is there. Yeah, I, I would say uh, it, it's like you've imagined. It's not just one or the other, but it's a combination of our collective responsibility, but also our our individual responsibility. But as a church, we are so often scrambling, and, and it's not always onerous or mischievous. We're trying to keep the church going. We're trying to keep ministering to people. There's so many pressures and, 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 um, and demands. Uh, but what we 
lose courage to do is to say, no, being part of us, this church, and following Christ as we're yoked together means you're going to be a student. You're going to be learning. And historically, churches have done that and just, uh, you know, taken the back the bullet and, de- and make these demands. You won't bring everybody along with you. But the idea was you, you had to be in training to really live out the Christian life and to learn how to think things through in a Christianly fashion. And so um, not only has our culture lost a kind of any remembrance of any Christian indebtedness uh, or appreciation for any Christian things, it's so often to see. But, the you know, instead of just looking outward and, and blaming and being angry, which is hard not to do sometimes, you know, uh, we, we also have to look inward and say, wow, what, what have we forfeited and what have we neglected? And so um, I, I, I do think you have people sensing that the only way we can go forward is kind of to rediscover our Christian identity and circle the wagons and, and teach and rediscover what it means to, to uh, be formed around Christian ideas. And, um, In time, I I do think uh, by the Spirit's uh, work in us, we can learn some discernment. And, um, you know, without discernment, I think we're just going to be kind of an image of our culture. We may be on the right side or the left side, but uh, it it, it won't matter if you're on the right of those two sides. Absolutely. Uh, If you don't have your Christian moorings you're going to go adrift one way or the other Hmm. yeah and you have to have you have to have some structure you know like you have to have something to compare to and i think that's part of it is that um you know we just I, i think most christians if you went up and asked them you know to explain certain doctrines they i don't know that they would necessarily be able to i um I did an interview uh, last year with um, Daniel Williams on, on his book, 95 Theses for a New Reformation. And that was one thing he talked about a lot was like, we need to, uh, so often like Christianity, people go in and they think it's about feeling or, um, you know, even when you go into the structure of a worship um it's structured to like take you through this range of emotions. Right. And so Mm -hmm. if our, if our faith is only founded on emotions, then when our emotions change, then we feel like we don't have faith anymore, you know? And so we don't, we don't know where we're at because you you need to have, I mean, you're, everybody's going to go through times where they feel more distant from God. And so you need to have that understanding so that you can reason through things, even when you're emotionally not feeling, you know, sometimes it's your emotion kind of carries but sometimes you have to have like your understanding like have this ordered emotion like okay you're feeling this now but you know look and like especially i think it's important for people to write their testimony and like remember what god's done for them because when you come through a hard time you can look back and say okay this is what god did for me then i know he's going to come through for me again but it i mean even sometimes with pastor sermons you know i can sometimes when you listen to like sermons it will be there's like this cadence to it you know and it's like it's just this they could be saying anything and they'd be taking people through the same emotion because they kind of trigger these emotions with you know the way they have a pattern to their message mm-hmm. yeah I, I, yeah i would I'm, say I'm- Oh, go ahead, Randy. Go ahead, please, Ben. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, and I think that's part of our goal is like the emotions aren't bad. It's just like you said, it's when that's your only foundation. And so trying to bring all those things together. And so because I think I think that is what drives, uh, uh, you know, what Randy and I would hold in common here is uh, and brought us together is like this a, a a good solid understanding of who God is actually derives how, why you engage him that way in certain ways. And it's uh, when we encounter difficult times. So, um, so many people leave the faith because they, they, something evil happens to them. 
something bad, you know, that they're harmed by others or even harmed within the church, or they have these different expectations. And, and part of this uh, theology of God's work in the world is that evil is pervasive. And so almost uh, we need to expect evil rather than be surprised by it in that sense. And so that when we encounter evil, then um, we don't lose our faith in the midst of that. But it's part of that, that knowledge then that pulls together and drives the way that we engage God and others. And I think that it's the emotional and the rational um, go hand in hand in, in the best of Christian faith. Dr. Hatchett, did you want to add to this? No, I, I don't know that I could say say it much better than, than Ben uh, if I tried. But I, I think there's really something to a kind of impoverishment um, when uh, it, it's only sort of uh, sort of supported by um, a, a kind of a, an emotional or a dramatic sort of uh, sensation. Uh, you know, the ancients used to think uh, that feeling good was was part of the equation. But most of them linked it to being good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we sort of have our, our notion about happiness now as, you know, I am presently stimulated in a satisfying way for this moment. And, um, you know, it's sort of a flippant sort of thing. Um, so I, I think there's great wisdom in the ancient church, which, which said, yeah, your emotions are part of that, but uh, the reason you will feel better is because you're being healed in Christ. <laughs> and the reason you can have confidence is not your simple strength and whatever, but you have this confidence in, in God's future. Once you've uh, kind of been joined with him, you're going to share in the future that he has for you. And so, uh, again, it, it's it's got to be an emotion that's uh, that's rooted realistically in the truth we know about God and that part of the truth we already see taking shape in us. And that's a remarkable thing when you when you see the work of the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life or your life. It gives you this great confidence about where the destiny of God will take you. And um, that's that's long term, a, a kind of a foundation for building a life. My instantaneous sense of am I being, you know, uh, excited or uh, thrilled at this moment uh, is kind of feeble by comparison. Yeah, I, uh, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like you, the end isn't here. I, I don't, I, now that you say that, there was a, I read an article a few months ago where somebody did an interview with Google AI, um, that like read all these books and like kind of would answer questions based on the, um, you know, what, what this AI had read. And so in the article, they end with us. Uh, so what is the meaning of life? And the AI said, if you don't believe that there's a God, there is no purpose. I was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was like, really? Like, go to the Google says. That's, there's no there's no point without God but this isn't the end and if we don't believe mm -hmm. that then mm -hmm. you know how do you how, really how do you make sense of things but mm -hmm. um we're going to talk a little bit about some specific theologies and or not theologies but specific heresies and these are things um I asked them to I sent a message when I asked them about this I identified these three specifically just because I see people with these misunderstandings all the time. Um, I, I get comments on my videos. I get uh, see people, uh, even Christian teachers that don't have a right understanding about this. What they're teaching is actually heretical. And so these are three that I think it's, uh, if you don't learn about any other heresies, if you can get an understanding about what these heresies are and the right understanding about this, I think this will take you a long way. So um, anyway, we're going to start with one called Apollinarianism. And Dr. Hatchett is going to explain this one. Yeah, Apollinarius was um, a churchman. 
he heads to the Council of Constantinople in 381. Now, what has happened before in 325 in Nicaea, the people there at the council signed a, a confession that uh, argued against subordinationism. In other words, against the idea that the sun is some sort of lower octane God. And it really seems to wed in solidarity the son and the father together in character. So that's a rather lofty thing. Jesus is fully divine. It's a rather lofty idea. And Apollinarius went about trying to sort of figure out how that would work in real practice. Uh, when he gets to 381, he finds himself utterly condemned. Uh, he had been working on the other end of this equation, and that is if, if, this, if the sun is really, really divine, um, then, and shares in the, in the Father's uh, kind of uh, uh, being in nature, then how could he be human? And he proposes something that you see in the ancient world, and that is sort of a hybrid approach. He argued that Jesus had a genuine body and that he had this genuine um, psyche. He uses actually Aristotle's terms, and I'm not using those, but a, a psyche, a soul, a, a, a sort of a place where we find our um, emotion, ambition, and so on. Uh, but it just didn't seem fitting for him that Jesus would be subject to having a human intellect or mind. Our minds are flighty and uh, they land where they shouldn't and on and on. He just couldn't imagine that the son of God really was completely human. And so he proposed the idea that maybe it was the divine word, the, the, the word that is incarnated that John talks about in the first gospel. Maybe it's that word that really just takes the place of the human mind. And so Jesus would be kind of a composite of being then. The incarnated word would have the word functioning and then inside a kind of a, or, or in, in, in line with a, a human emotion or, or psyche and then a human body. Uh, one professor, not too far down the road, uh, you know, says comedically, it's a God in the bod. And again, <laughs> In a way, it's like, well, somebody's trying to make sense of this lofty idea and recognition that he's divine. Uh, but what uh, he, he's just somewhat surprised about is so many of his peers find this just so terribly objectionable. And for them, they were driving off this idea that the son is on this mission from God and he comes down to this world and he really enters into the world, even the messiness of the world. He has complete and genuine solidarity with us. Now, he's true to God's call where we're failures, but that doesn't actually negate his humanity. That actually gives us a picture of what real humanity looks like. Mm -hmm. And so uh, not only is he truly human, he is the true human. And so this idea of he he has left on the mission to come have this complete solidarity with us. Ancient Christians thought that was crucial because one day their destiny was that if they have joined him in this faith, one day they will share him in a fellowship that includes Father, Son, and Spirit. And so the hybrid approach was rejected because not only is Jesus in our language fully human, but he's all uh, fully divine. He's also fully human. And the church wisely would not compromise on either of those convictions. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, I that was one I had a hard time understanding at first. And um, even after I read it, uh, Dr. H I went into class and Dr. Hatchett just had on a little pad of paper and he said well if jesus didn't fully enter into our experience then he couldn't actually redeem us he had to be truly human fully human in order for us for him to be able to redeem us and so he had to have the full be actually human and not just like partially human but i see that a lot people think that jesus was something other than human in some way as he was <clears throat> walking here. 
But, um, and that leads us to our next heresy that's very common, which is docetism. And so Dr. Blackwell, do you wanna explain what that is? Yeah, sure. This is uh, this predates Apollinarianism, so it, it takes us a step closer to the New Testament or between uh, the early church history. And so um, I know we'll talk about Gnosticism here in just a second, but it, it, it builds off this idea that the spiritual and the physical worlds don't really fit together well. And so if God is on the, if one is, uh, not only do they not fit together well, that one ultimately is good and one is ultimately bad. So this dualism, and of course, God then is going to be on the good side and not the material side. So the good side then is the spiritual. And so if we're going to talk about docetism relates specifically to the way uh, people viewed Christ. Did Was he really human when he came uh, incarnate? And docetism says, no, he's not really hum human. He only seemed to be human. And this is where we get the word uh, docetism from. It's from the Greek word that means to seem. And so there are a couple of different versions of this that uh, Irenaeus, he's writing in the 170s uh, AD, so a couple of generations after the New Testament. He uh, says that uh, some uh, early Christians that uh, said he only seemed to have any physical body, so he was more like a ghost. He was just a spiritual being that had this appearance, but not really physically there. And then others said that uh, actually the human man Jesus was there and the spiritual Christ came at his baptism and inhabited him. So in a way that we might think of demonic uh, oppression in a negative fashion, that this was a positive thing, that the spiritual Christ came and uh, motivated him. Sometimes we use the language of the Holy Spirit driving us and leading us. That would be the way that they talked about um, the Christ coming and inhabiting the man Jesus. And then before the cross happened, the, this Christ left him and just uh, the human man suffered because physical suffering is not what God would be about. And so the, the Christ would leave. Uh, but the whole idea here was that these, these two aspects of reality just don't work together. Right. And so the incarnation of the divinity and humanity that we see in Apollinarianism, Apollinarius said he has a real body, just not a, a full human uh, intellect. Right. And so it's still, they were wrapped around one another. Whereas the docetist said, look, it, you can't even wrap them around one another. They're just two opposite things. And so I th it speaks to this issue of did God create a good world? What was, is this physical world something deficient by nature or is it something that sin has corrupted? And of course, if you have a good theology that brings together creation and the hope of new creation that this physical world we redeemed that Christ then too came in fully and participated in this and not uh, was corrupted by it, but actually healed it. And so uh, some of the language that comes around later is that if if there's any aspect of humanity he didn't take on, then that aspect of humanity wasn't healed. Uh, and so this is why him just having a physical body uh, didn't, he, you know, our minds need uh, great healing, you know, and so for Christ to take on both the rational soul and a body is is essential for our understanding of the incarnation not not just because it's a doctrinal piece but it, it speaks to how we're transformed but also to this larger idea that the spiritual and the physical are not in opposition to one another and actually in actuality and in, in god's purpose in creation to new creation it's when uh, they work best together when they're in harmony and so we can encounter god uh in in uh, authentic ways uh, in our physical reality. That's an, that's an awesome explanation. And that's really what, um, as Isaiah 53, right? It covers mm. every single aspect of ourselves, physical, emotional, spiritual, that Jesus redeemed. And I think that um, that, it's hard. To, I don't know. I don't know why, but we have, I think a lot of times, like at least with modern Christians, we have a heretical understanding of Jesus. We think he was something other than us and we don't understand that he was fully us totally. 
And so that's what can give us hope about our situation entirely. But um, when I was, again, when I was interviewing um, uh, Donald Williams, he said he has a section in his book on, I guess, on pietism. And in it, and I had never read this before, but he said that um, the understanding during the New Testament time of, of heart was about the whole self. It wasn't, we seem to think of it as like our feelings, our emotions, but it's not. It was like everything, all that we are, everything that we are, this whole integration. And we seem to have a separation of that mm -hmm. now. But um, the other one that we're going to cover is Gnosticism. And uh, Dr. Hatchett, do you want to explain that heresy? Yeah, I'll take a turn. I don't know if you plan it this way, Carla, but just think of the ones that we're addressing. Um, they really emphasize how very tangible and earthy and world affirming Christianity is. Mm -hmm. In other words, when we come, come to the place of Christ, there were just some Christians who just said, oh, I just can't imagine him really being fully human. Or uh, others uh, earlier, like the docetists, they said, no, he could only appear human. He, he you know, God couldn't be kind of linked or somehow incarnated like we think. Uh, again, there's this kind of uh, irony. Most people today think of Christians are, you know, as uh, they just they deny life and they deny fun. You know, the old joke is, you know, if, if it's if it seems fun, a Christian is against it. Right. You know, they just, they, anything, and everything, they just seem to deny uh, life. But in, in the ancient world, you see it more clearly. The, the reality is the Christians are the ones who are really saying yes to life and yes to creation and yes to the destiny that God still has of her creation and that he's not uh, surrendered that. In fact, he's given generously to redeem it. With these Gnostics, again, you have this uh, uh, a kind of movement. We, we don't really know the history and the origin or sources of Gnosticism. We, we use that title, though, to to uh, describe a number of groups and movements. In the book, I paraphrase, uh, an, a, I think, a wise old approach to this from years ago in a book called Early Christian Doctrine. There, this old Oxford Don said, let's don't fight anymore about <laughs> where Gnosticism comes from and speculate. Let's just give you a profile of these big second century Gnostic t uh, systems and teachers that we have good documentation for. So he drew together five sort of characteristics. I don't know if I need to run through all five or whatever, but you'll, you'll find them in the book. Um, and uh, the big thing uh, around Gnosticism is maybe that second item in the list is that they see an absolute opposition like Ben mentioned. Uh, but they don't just have a tension. This, this is like this division on steroids. They think that by its nature, something that is mental or spiritual, non-physical, is pure. And that by its very nature, the tangible, physical, material world is inherently evil. Uh, it, it, even if it's seen for what it is, it's ugly. And so when you have this dramatic kind of contrast, the Christian story just doesn't work anymore. Uh, they're not comfortable with Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created, right? They're certain that it, whatever the uh, supreme reality of the world, and they called it a variety of things, some call it God, that, that, that thing could never create the physical world. And uh, there were these lesser spiritual beings uh, that vary in potency and purity. And it was one of these lower knockoff gods, our spiritual beings, that out of either meanness are, are just negligence made the world. There would be no good reason to create the physical world. It is unredeemable, irredeemable. You ju it just cannot be repaired. So uh, you can kind of map out the rest of it then in terms of who we are. Well, there's actually probably several categories for some of these Gnostics about what kind of people there are, but for the most promising, uh, we have a spiritual element in us, but we're trapped behind enemy lines. We're in this evil world within this evil body. And so learning the proper teaching 
teaches us to look beyond the facade of the physical world and, and to take it as real and serious or valuable in any sense. And it trains us to gain a liberty of our mental or spiritual self. And salvation then becomes leaving the building, right? I mean, you got to exit this place where you don't belong. Uh, and you, there's a spiritual journey, perhaps, towards a purity. But the first, uh, the first uh, crucial element of that is you have to abandon the evil world. Mm-hmm. Now, this shows up everywhere. It shows up in current kind of conversations about uh, who Jesus is from serious ones to kind of not so serious ones like the Da Vinci Code. It's serious because it's popular. It's not serious because of its X's nose. But uh, it, it shows up in, in that kind of conversation. It shows up in ancient church. And sadly, some critics say we have a Gnostic light version of Christianity sometimes. And uh, even in my own tradition of conversionism, I'm a Baptist. I believe in that Billy Graham kind of conversion. I think people get saved. I, I do want to stipulate, I don't think everybody's getting saved looks the same. Uh, but I, I'm a conversionist. I'm completely all in. But, you know, I, I can hear some Christian brothers talk about, you know, it's as if though God is reaching down and, and plucking somebody out of this world that is going to hell in a handbasket without any promise. It's as if though God has no future for the world. You would also imagine that these people would have little place for the resurrection of the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you just remember the resurrection is kind of the, the centerpiece uh, of uh, what Paul talks about. And when he culminating his reflection on Jesus's life, uh, redeeming all of creation is crucial. And uh, so God wants all of you. There's not a disposable part of you. It's not like the Gnostics say uh, your psyche, your mental peer, you know, your, your perspective and, and, and outlook, whatever there is of you, uh, God redeems and all of his creation is important. And this this approach uh, just argues that God would never really invest in the tangible world. Uh, It's a vexing idea, and it's surprising how persistent this idea comes and encroaches on Christian practice and sometimes deceives us. Can I, can I give one just a quick summary of this? Uh, the Bible Project has a, a video on heaven and earth, and, and they make the claim that the, the story of the Bible uh, is the union of heaven and earth, right? It, it's the very thing that the Gnostics want to keep to, uh, apart from one another. And, and so much I, I describe in a, in a short way, describe what we're trying to do in engaging theology is the Bible Project meets theology. Uh, they're ter- telling the one common narrative of the Bible, and we uh, come and, and we work from that common narrative, but also show how theology, so your view of Jesus, your view of the Spirit, this work, your view of humanity, eschatology, how things turn out in the end, all fit within that biblical narrative. And so that uh, engaging theology then is the Bible project meets uh, systematic theology. Oh, I'll, awesome. I'll, I'll put a plug in, too, if I can. Uh, and and uh, uh, brag a little bit uh, as well. And that is one of the things I find uh, constructive about our project is we're not just selecting a text or two. Uh, ben does a, a beautiful job. That's primarily him. I confuse it and complicate it sometimes when, when I, but Ben does a beautiful job in showing how that doctrine fits with the entire arc of the whole big biblical story. And when you see that whole big biblical story, it, it forces you to be reminded that any kind of Gnostic scheme can't work because we're heading toward a destiny where God brings to fruition and completion his purpose in creation. He doesn't discard creation. He redeems creation. And, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I want to give my... Uh, uh, co-author there, I think, uh, props on something that's really very valuable in our in our book. 
and and that's important too, isn't it? Because if you don't have a framework, like if you, it's the thing like when people have a hard time knowing what's true and what isn't. And so what you want to do is you want to, wherever you come at a thing, it should all be saying the same thing, you know? So you should, if you go, if an event happened, you should be able to go to multiple people and they would be saying the same thing. You should be able to see the physical evidence of it. You should be able to, there, you know, reality leaves a mark. And so when you have a framework and somebody comes and tells you something, and this framework that you know is true, if it doesn't fit that, that should be a flag. But if you don't ever have a framework, then somebody can come in and you have no basis for knowing whether something is true or not. And mm -hmm. um, I mentioned, you know, some of the false beliefs that we are causing such issues today. I mean, that's part of the reason why I wanted to discuss those three is, um, you know, there's entire, uh, I don't even know what to call them. They're like these little networks of basically uh, cultists going out and promoting like a false idea of God, you know, coming up with this. I, I don't, I don't even know, but there's these people out there saying that they are straight up Gnostics. I mean, they're just saying that the, the body is evil. Um, do you guys know about the, the group that in Dallas since November that thought JFK was going to, and was going to reappear. Have you read oh. about that? Okay. Yeah, I haven't heard. I, I, I specialize in uh, reading dead people. And so contemporary <laughs> conspiracies are uh, well, lower, shorter, shorter on the, <laughs> to find out about. Okay. Well, you might want to start reading about reading it. You follow like a lot of the latest things on Twitter, but, um, a fun fact, I actually, one of the promoters has an email address that's kind of similar to my business email that I have for Gmail. <laughs> and he must have said his email wrong one time because I started getting a slew of all these. Uh, okay. emails. And I was thinking, I, at first I thought it was just like phishing attempts because it would be like links to like Rumble and some of this stuff. And, and, and then finally, I don't know how I figured it out, but... Anyway, I started getting these, uh, this lady sent me a message think, or thinking it was this guy. And I had gotten some other ones that I, a lot of them I had just deleted, but there were, there were two that I responded to. And one was a guy who was asking this person who I don't think has any expertise on anything, but he was asking him for medical advice and where to get a, um, basically a fake vaccine exemption. And I was like, uh, so I replied and I said, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't, you know, have a resource for you for fraudulent exemptions, but you know, he had a lot of uh, medical conditions. And I said, if you don't want to listen to your doctor, then, you know, he, make sure you have this link for where the monoclonal antibody fusion centers are near you. And I linked to a book uh, on a journal on Amazon. It's called I'm dead. Now what, you know, fill this out because, you know, if you don't, you get COVID with your conditions, you're dead. And so anyway, I had re responded to him. And then I got this email from this lady who um, this, this promoter, QAnon promoter has been promoting this other guy who is like this spiritual guru. And you want to talk about Gnosticism. I mean, I read Air Against Heresies last year as my big theological read. And the first section of it was really hard because it's like so crazy. You know, it's like mm -hmm. trying to keep your brain straight on just reading that first section about what those early Gnostics believed. The stuff they're teaching is crazier than that. And so anyway, she sent a, an email and she was going to this guy who, again, I don't think he has an expert, his expertise in anything, just making up stuff. I don't know. And she said, I don't understand this. I trust you, but he's talking about reincarnation. Can you explain this to me? Like, so the, the guy's followers are, I think, mainly think they're Christians or maybe they are. I don't, I don't know. And so I did respond to her and I said, I watched the first 10 minutes of it and it was like so much, it was like, you could write an entire book just refuting that first 10 minutes. And I said, you know, I, I just kind of went through it, you know, like what some of the issues were. And I said, you know, this, 
I've only responded to two people and this man that I responded to, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be dead because he's following this person, but you are running the risk of being damned because you're following somebody who's preaching a false gospel and a false, you know, a false Christ. I mean, that is literally what they're talking about. And they, uh, this group has, uh, I, I just, it's a story. There's a lot of articles on it. There's this yeah. guy mm-hmm. who he's doing, uh, he has people just entranced because he, he rattles off gematria all the time. And, you know, it's like, I'm sorry, but that's nonsense. I mean, gematria is nothing other than an attempt to make the Bible say it's something that it doesn't say, you know, because Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. So you can't just read it for what it says. You have to make it say something else, right? So anyway, but yeah, he's there. He has had this whole group of people, like about a thousand people waiting for Mm -hmm. JFK and JFK Jr. to show up. And they, they still are. And what's really scary is that they've been talking about um, having to pass through death to experience life. It's almost, and they, he, he has them taking this, drinking this stuff. It's like he's prepping them for another Jonestown. I mean, it's mm. really scary. And I, yeah. I just, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I taught Sunday school for third graders, but I don't know how anybody who's a pastor of a church can't, see this and be concerned about their people and what they're watching mm-hmm. and what they're yeah. believing. Carla, I'm reminded of a, a, a great apologist, an apologist like yourself. Uh, he, to paraphrase him, he made this observation. He said, you know, contemporary people are so sophisticated and look down their nose at faith and and reject the idea that God has come to reclaim his world in Christ. But when they reject that, they seem to be subject to falling for weirder and weirder and more bizarre, <laughs> right? It's mm-hmm. not as if though we turn off the switch and really become secularists. It's almost as if though we become more susceptible to wild ideas than ever before. That's true, but a yeah. lot of these people think they're Christians, and it's like they don't know what it is they're supposed to be believing. Like this, they've told these. This crew has told them that we don't. The Bible that we have isn't the real Bible. That there's like you know, I, there's different numbers, mm-hmm. like six hundred and seventeen or seven hundred and seventy-seven books. And what what are we going to find out when we mm-hmm. get our real Bible? And it's like, oh man. <laughs> Well, that's it. Makes me think. Actually, this fits in with Gnosticism and these other Docetism, Apollinarianism. Like these are all people that were following Jesus, right? I mean, they they oh, weren't yeah. following Zeus yeah. or Apollo or yeah. whomever, Marduk or Baal. These were Jesus followers, but they were uh, heretical, right? They're heterodox, and so uh, one of the the hardest things to do to help people figure out is when you hear religious spiritual language to know that that doesn't itself mean that it's good. Um, I, I think of this, I mean, it, it uh, I have a dollar bill here, you know, and right on all our money, it says in God, we trust, which I, you know, a hundred percent believe in. I think that's been uh, essential to our American heritage, but, would we replace that with in Jesus we trust? Mm. And a lot of people would balk at that. Well, the word God sounds spiritual and makes me feel good. But if I, you know, Orthodox Christianity says Jesus is as much God as the father is God. And so we should be able to replace those terms. In fact, that's what it means to be Christian is to believe and trust in Jesus. Um, but if we won't want to, if we wouldn't switch that, that tells me something that this is a this isn't necessarily just a Christian articulation that we're saying there. It's just something that sounds religious, and mm-hmm. therefore people will feel good about it, but actually not be drawn to actual faith that's yeah. uh, saving faith. And so these other forms, these contemporary forms, do you know it, it plays out? What what happens is you take Jesus and then you wrap him in some cultural wrapper. And so that's what the Gnostics did, right? And then you Mm -hmm. transform it. Well, 
these other groups that you're talking about here, they take a little bit of Jesus and spiritual language and then just wrap it in some kind of contemporary quasi spiritual heretical kind of wrapping that transforms and, and takes away the uh, whole foundation of what it, it is about. Um, yeah. And I, that's, I think that's exactly what it is. Um, I, when I interviewed uh, Holly Ordway about her book, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit about um, why Christians have a, such hard, a hard time or people in general have such a hard time recognizing the Christian elements in the Lord of the Rings. And, you know, I think part of it is because people don't have a really good under, they don't have a true understanding of what their faith is. They don't truly understand. Or they don't, you know, there's a lot of uh, biblical illiteracy. So when you don't know it, what is true for yourself, you can't recognize it unless if you are sitting in church and somebody says something. And so, you know, these people that are follow, believing all this stuff, you know, it's just, it, there's like this facade of Christianish. And, and so it sounds sort of religious. It sounds sort of mm -hmm. like something they'd mm -hmm. hear in church, but they don't under, identify the error in it. And the guy that I was getting the emails from or for, um, you know, he was formerly a Mormon. So some of the stuff that he's following now isn't like outside of the Mormon wheelhouse, like, you know, corrupt. They believe that the Bible was corrupted. They believe that, you know, that mm -hmm. God was mm -hmm. originally a man that became God. And so this for him, what he was taught, it's not outside of that, but for Christians, it's, not compatible these things are not you can't reconcile what they're teaching and having a true christian faith mm -hmm. but anyway well we went over our time but thank you so much for sharing this also this is just a um i didn't ask you guys this beforehand i'm just i'm curious like how you would explain this so i've been um teaching in pakistan and uh actually last week i taught at a um spoke at a uh, pastor's conference in Karachi. Um, and I was talking about like, okay, well, what is it that you want me to cover? And we had a discussion about theology and they're like, well, uh, the pastor there said, we like biblical theology rather than systematic. So I, I'm not really understanding like what the difference is between the two. Do, do you know what they would see that as a difference? Well, I'll say it's actually one of the things that we're trying to heal that division through engaging theology is that um, over time, if you look at, say, Irenaeus or Augustine or Luther, even when he's when Luther's reading his commentary on Galatians, for instance, he's seeing his con the, the Bible speak directly to his contemporary experience. Whereas as time went on and the enlightenment and the separation between the Bible speaking to the original audience versus it speak, you know, what it means today, you have biblical theology then versus systematic theology, which are these categories. And, um, and so what often is there's this artificial barrier that's been between that. And, and part of, you know, what we're trying to show here is that narrative that undergirds the Bible is the same narrative that undergirds theology. I mean, it, it is the same narrative of creation through the Son and redemption through the Spirit. And, um, you know, and so I think it's that sense of like, just, you know, teach the Bible, but teach it in its holistic fashion and not in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, but then also, as Randy talked about earlier, it's not just one or two verses here or there, right? It's not, we're not just using a concordance here to look up all these specific ideas. Um, it's the whole tenor and scope of God's work through uh, history that I think, that, you know, that needs to be brought back together. Because it, in the same way that practice has been separated from a lot of discussion of theology, it just becomes some ideas, you know, it's that, that that dualism there between idea and practice. Uh, the story of the Bible has been, the dual, there's a dualism there between that and kind of the ideas of theology. So you would say it's an artificial distinction? Like it's. Uh, I, I think historically the church 
would see it as an art. Historically, Christians have held those together. It, it's mm -hmm. in since the 17, 1800s that as an academic approach, biblical studies got separated from systematic theology. Okay. Uh, and so then we quit having these kind of mutual conversations. We do two different things when you're talking about these two different areas, rather than how does the Bible speak to the life of the church today? So it, um, some, and of course, uh, Randy can speak to this uh, probably even more directly than I can, because this is the whole question of hermeneutics um, right. behind this. Well, I... I'm, I'm sorry to say it's probably hard to, to nail down because these terms mean different things, <laughs> especially biblical theology. There, there might be a variety of things, so it's hard to parse what your pastor was asking you about. I think on the most basic approach, it would be uh, people who want to do biblical theology want to say, I want to keep and be merely descriptive of what the text says in its own kind of time and place and so on. And um, where systematic uh, folks have a, a kind of an obligation that, to do that with every scripture <laughs> and with the whole of scripture and then back up and say, OK, I'm not just going to tell you what John says about the Holy Spirit and what uh, Paul says about the Holy Spirit. I've got to eventually say something about the Holy Spirit and try to be faithful to all of those. So okay. there's always going to be this barrier. We have a little diagram in the book between economia and, and theolo theologia are the story-based approach, right? We've got to keep our, our reference constantly on the scripture, reading the scripture and the story. But we also, I think, are forced to ask questions about that and to theologize. Well, how do I put this image in the Bible alongside this other image of the Bible? And, and, mm -hmm. and Because they both describe God. So what am I going to say about God? So we have to do this the theologizing, but we always have to go back to the te text to read to see if our theologizing is is constructive. It, doesn't, it, it leads us to a, a, a more embrace of the, the whole of God's scripture, and it doesn't leave us away from scripture. So I, I think finally said uh, it, it um, systematic theology can be done in kind of a woodenly, uh, rational way that's kind of abstract, but the truth is this, you're always going to be theologizing when you're reading the Bible. You're going to be thinking about what this says about God yeah. and then what else it says about God and then saying, how do I put those things together? And so I, I think uh, the rule of thumb would be this. Uh, if I think the ancient church has given us some really constructive pieces wisely avoided these things we've today called heresy and stayed stubbornly around some crucial central convictions that almost all Christians embrace. And so I, I think that ancient church is a pretty good model for us. Um, and that, that honestly is the way to go forward with those people as our friends and our guides. We need to boldly return to scripture with the confidence that we can say something about God. Awesome. Well, we are, we've been talking about their book, Engaging Theology, and I hope that this has piqued your interest and that you pick up a copy. Um, you can get it on Amazon and uh, any other online bookseller. Um, and I highly recommend that you uh, add this to your library. And maybe you don't read through it straight through, but um, take it in pieces. And it's actually not that long of a book. It's not even quite 300 pages, right? Right. It yeah. has, yeah, it's, it's really not that long. Um, so anyway, it's, they have a lot of um, diagrams and illustrations to help, um, to help you understand it a little bit better. So we are going to wrap this up. Um, do, would you guys like to uh, say a few words at the end and tell us what you're doing and any final thoughts? Uh, Dr. Blackwell, do you want to start? Yeah, just uh, again, thanks for having us here. Uh, you know, our goal 
is always to hold these things together, you know, the life of the church. And so we're not just doing theology for the sake of what it uh, meant back in the day, uh, but also what it means here, but also that we're part of that story. I, I think that's what really motivates this book is that the early church, so Irenaeus and Athanasius and Augustine, that they model really healthy ways to hold together the, the life of the mind and the passion of the heart and, and, and an applied faith that works on a daily basis. And so I think that that is the, you know, in, in the classical world, it's the the true, you know, the beautiful that drives us and, and also the good that we do. And so the, mm -hmm. these uh, orthodoxy, ortho uh, pathy, uh, the, having the right passions and ortho uh, praxy uh, doing it right, I think is all goes together. And so the best, uh, the heart of the Christian faith is one where we love God with all of our heart, with all our soul and with all our strength. And, and that's uh, what we're after here. We, you know, really want to encourage the church to follow God and uh, experience him more uh, closely. That's awesome. Yeah, actually, that you said one time, I don't even remember when this was, um, you said that the point of Christian scholarship is to support the church. And maybe that's obvious, but I had never, I had never really seen that or understood it that way. And it kind of gave me a little bit more, um, I don't know, felt like, you know, what I'm doing and the things I like to do, that they do have an impact and that there's a purpose to them. Mm, for sure. For sure. So, Dr. Hatchett, how about you? Well, uh, I'll second what Ben said, and I, I just would encourage folks, uh, uh, pursuing this theology uh, is is again not just an idle curiosity. It, it is a discovery and a learning to trust who God is. Mm -hmm. And so I would I would greatly encourage uh, people to to approach it that way. Now, having said that, I think most of us in our journey along the way could use some um, some study of theology, some formal study. Like you're saying, without that, I think we're so vulnerable to any and every kind of crazy idea. So there's a popular Christian writer, too. There's several people who do this, who sort of say, you know, theology is kind of the skeleton, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you don't think of it as a vibrant life, <laughs> but the vibrant life of faith just wouldn't be really possible without it, right? Uh -huh. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you want flesh and blood, real life, full life. But that frame of the skeleton, you know, you're just not going to be a flourishing individual unless you have that kind of frame. And so I, I would encourage people to study some theology as a way to go forward. Uh, if you do it as a, an, an act of worship, I don't think you'll go wrong. Mm. That's, that is a great explanation. That, that it is when we study, when we're submitting our mind to God, it is an act of worship. I think of, I should look up this reference. Um, there's a verse in Psalms. It says, take the sacrifice, bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. And so each of the things that we do, it's like this, this sacrifice to God, right? This, this is what we're offering to him. So Thanks, Carla, your, your study is bearing a lot of fruit and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Very grateful. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, you can follow, I don't even think, Dr. Hatchet, are you even on social media? I'm sorry? Are you on social media at all? I, I have just recently created a Facebook. <laughs> okay. <So laughs> Dr. Only really for the purpose of uh, writing my wife a note on her our anniversary. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, I, well, I, I am there, though. Yeah. Okay. So, Maybe you can find Dr. Black or Dr. Hatchet on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Blackwell is on Twitter, and uh, so and you can also visit um, Houston Baptist University's website. And um, is there a newsletter sign up? I mean, I'm on the newsletter list, email list, but is there a sign up? People can sign up for notifications of like some of the events you have, like the because you have a, a yearly theology conference, right? Yeah, that's right. We're uh, in, had some leadership transition. So if you're interested in things related to HBU, you can uh, send an email to HTS. So for Houston Theological Seminary, uh, HTS at HBU.edu. And then uh, we'll um, 
be able to connect you there. We're slowly kind of building up the theology side. The uh, apologetic side has been uh, much better in the past about kind of uh, living in the 21st century. <laughs> in, in, in theology, we've uh, uh, read a, a, you know, focus on things uh, so old that we're sometimes we're slow to catch up with things. And so, but anyhow, that uh, our goal actually is to better connect with the uh, believers. Uh, one of the things that's great, you know, if people are interested or to take courses with us, um, you can survey, uh, you don't have to be a student, but you can participate in our graduate level classes. And here, uh, you know, that, that class on theology that you took with Dr. Hatchett, uh, he's uh, teaching hermeneutics now, I believe, you know, and so people can sit on, on that. I'm teaching a New Testament theology class. And so uh, check that out. We use the language of surveyor um, so that if you're auditing, you have to be in the system and all this kind of stuff. But uh, so if you go to hbu.edu slash surveyors, uh, you can see courses to participate then, you know, there. But um, but yeah, uh, check me out. I'm very happy to connect with uh, questions and um, uh, let you know more if you have uh, or, you know, answer questions, let you know more about us. Awesome. And they do have Facebook um, pages too that are, mm -hmm. that post a lot of it. Or, so I know uh, Biblical Languages, they have a very active Facebook page and apologetics and there's a graduate. So if people were, is there a School of Christian Thought one too, or? Uh, not the School of Christian Thought. So the Houston Theological Seminary is, has okay. that, uh, so Houston Theo Sim is uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, uh, but also the study theology is the face Facebook at HBU um, okay. there. But, you know, if you Google us, we'll find us. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> in that sense. But yeah, uh, yeah biblical language, uh, much more humorous. Uh, so they're probably the uh, the fun one to follow there. But yeah, they, they are. A lot well. of great memes. Yeah. Really awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> can't miss that one okay well uh thank you very much for joining us and again if you pick up engaging theology and if you have any questions um attend an uh, upcoming event that they're going to be they have events all the time that you can discuss this more with them so anyway well thanks for watching us and we will see you next time all bye -bye. right bye-bye thanks for having us thank you bye, -bye.